How have you found the season so far? So you're back on the, the super stock uh, this year. How have you found it um, to date? Yeah, it's, uh, it was a tough start to the season with the, the lack of testing uh, and a new bike. There's not a lot of data super stock wise with the Yamaha, so we've had a bit of work on with that side of it. Um, normally I'd have done quite a lot of riding out in Spain pre-season and the, the team goes testing there as well. Um, we did get quite a lot of track time booked in the UK but obviously with the weather that we have over here it was a bit of a washout throughout testing and um, so knock hill was a good test that was the start of it really and then since then it's been a bit of a testing at each race meeting for us and um, it's been getting better we've progressed massively um, sort of the two races we had at knock hill at round two the first race I was 24 seconds behind the leader and the, the second race I was 12 seconds and then after Thruxton we were five seconds behind the leader so we've definitely made some big improvements and the bike's starting to feel really good now. What do you think those changes have been? Like, What have you actually changed precisely to kind of make those massive gains then? Um, there's a lot of electronic stuff with the super stock bikes where we can only run a kit ECU um, and there's a lot of the stuff, traction control, anti wheelie stuff like that that it, we didn't. Nobody really understood overnight with with the new kitties who out with Yamaha, so we didn't know what was holding the bike back a lot of the time. So yeah, pretty much most of it's come from that, and um, gearing's been a little bit testing at some of the tracks because we don't get a lot of track time. The first couple of rounds were split groups with super stock because there were so many in them, so we got 20 minutes, um, which isn't enough to try change the gearing within a session. So. That, that was a little bit costly to us, but um, yeah, it's, it's been a good bike apart from that. Um, so taking it right back to the start then of your career, even before your kind of career started, um, what age were you when you first started riding and really getting a passion for it in terms of racing? I didn't start racing until I was 21, so I wasn't brought up with racing, I wasn't brought up with motorbikes or anything, but um, I met a lad when I was at grammar school that was British trials champion and that was a start of I mean I, I liked motorbikes before that but I never really spent any time with anyone or with a motorbike so that was the kickstart to it and I did a lot of begging then to my parents to get a trials bike um, but they weren't like in a position to just buy anything I wanted so um, but I got a TY175 when I was about 15 I think it was so that was the start of my love for motorbikes really and then um, as soon as I was 17, I met a group of friends in, in the local pub that I used to go to that had road bikes. They were three or four years older than me, but um, that sort of got me onto the road bike scene. So I bought a TZR 250 RSP, beautiful thing. Uh, crashed it about three or four times, <laughs> ended up completely wrecking it, um, but uninjured. And then did a few more years of ZXR 400, a Fireblade, 900 Fireblade. Uh, and then track days started coming in a bit then, so we did a couple of track days and that was it. We, were, we wanted to go racing, so three of us that were part of this group riding road bikes ended up getting 600cc bikes and going road racing, circuit racing. So you never really had aspirations of becoming what you now are in terms of your standing in, in the sport? No. Um, I mean, as soon as I started racing, I loved it, but like how we were doing it at the start is slightly different to how it ended up you know we were going in a beaten up old van and caravan and drinking most of the weekend at night and uh and then obviously racing during the day but um yeah it was mega fun and once i started winning some races i wanted to move up and it just ended up being quite a steep curve right at the start i moved up every year from from starting club racing um so yeah the success kept getting a bit of a kickback as I moved up, but I still uh, loved going. Who was your favourite sports person when you were growing up? Was there a kind of rider, even though I know you said you didn't grow up with bikes, but did you used to watch it? Did you used to kind of see somebody that you thought, yeah, I'd like to be like them? Yeah, I never started watching any bike racing until probably when I was riding road bikes when I was 17, and it was always Valentino Rossi then. He was sort of, like, just totally stood out from anybody else, and yeah. He was the, the guy, um, but before that I wasn't really big into any sports on telly or anything. And obviously now you, you're used to competing kind of year in, year out. What do you think is like the best thing about competing in a race? Like what's the thing that really excites you about racing? Uh, 
I think you, you take it a little bit for granted when you're racing and also once you've had some success and you want more success, the weekends pass quickly without really thinking about it if you don't have the success because you're just not happy all the time. <laughs> so yeah, it changes quite a lot and um, I have to remind myself quite a bit as to the fact that I am lucky to be able to ride these bikes and and to enjoy the weekend sometimes regardless of the result. <laughs> How hard is that though when, you, when you're really disappointed? Are you the sort of guy that won't go out and will just kind of be so disappointed and not show your face or do you manage to kind of still put it behind you and get out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty miserable when I'm, when I'm not getting any results. So. But I think it's what's got me where I got results wise and stuff and obviously it's part of why I'm still going now. So the obvious question now, so obviously back in 2010 you had a, a serious accident and for those that don't know, and if you could just recall kind of your memories of that and how it came about, um, what you thought when it when it happened, and the, your thoughts kind of in the immediate aftermath of it as well. Yeah, well, it all sort of really came about. The, the starting trigger point for it was qualifying badly at Silverstone. Um, I'd been running the first couple of rows all year with Glenn Richards, my teammate. And um, we had a problem with the bike in qualifying at Silverstone. I qualified, I think I was 14th. So starting back there was far from ideal. Um, and then the weather on the day was horrendous. It was like very, very wet. Um, <clears throat> a lot of standing water and almost dark for our race. So um, I had no option but to go sort of around the outside at Turn 1. Obviously Turn one's very wide at Silverstone. So, I left myself vulnerable, but from where I was starting so far back, I had no option and I was on the outside of the grid. Um, and then a rider, Graham Gowland, sort of had a high side on the inside and just clipped my front wheel, um, but didn't like completely wipe me out. It just knocked me off the side of the bike. So I ended up laid in the middle of the track with everyone else still to come through and obviously so much spray and the conditions as they were, I ended up getting ridden over by the last man on the grid. So. That, that was that. What was your first thought at that point? I mean, do you remember what you thought when that originally happened? Yeah, I was just devastated, really. I mean, I'd put so much into my career and just come back from the TT, winning all five races in a week, gone to the Ulster Grand Prix. Uh, I think I won four races, had a really good Ulster, and then uh, won the Gold Cup at Scarborough. Everything was just, like, brilliant at the time, and then... Uh, I'm laid on the floor and my leg hanging off, you know, the bone was out of the back of my levers and it was a lot of panic and a lot of why me, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose up till then I'd been lucky. I'd done 10 years of racing and only broken a collarbone throughout the whole lot. So some people get broken something every single year and I just got it all in one, one big hit. <laughs> people say, don't they, with like injuries that you go through like different phases of like, you know, the shock, the disappointment, the anger, and that. What was the? How long did it take you to kind of accept it after it had happened for you to like move on from it? I guess and, and push on. Uh, well, I was in a bad way for a good month, like a real bad way, in hospital on the PCA or whatever it's called. Push button, give yourself morphine every however many minutes. Um, so yeah, most of that I don't really remember too much. I was a lot of hallucinating and all that going on. So. When I came out of there, it was, I just wanted to get back as quick as I could really and um, sort of give myself a three month target as if you break your tibia, which obviously I didn't have a broken tibia, I had no tibia left. So it wasn't sort of a reasonable thought process, but I think if I'd genuinely known at the time that it was going to take two, three years or whatever, I don't know how I could have ever kept pushing to come back racing, you know, it just, it just seems ridiculous and I get a lot of messages off people, anyone that sort of breaks the leg in bike racing now, contact me and, um, you know, I, I just say that in the grand scheme of things, when, it, when you are at the end of it, even if it does take a year or two years, whatever, you're a long time in life for two years, it actually is nothing, you know, throughout your lifespan, so I've managed to go on and race for another 10 years after it, so and get smashed up again and come back. So yeah, it's, uh, I think it, you've just got to keep pushing on. It's not the end. Yeah. But obviously there must have been really tough points in that journey where mental, obviously one thing is the physical health, isn't it, around kind of the, 
the leg itself, but how difficult was it for you mentally to kind of get over that and recover? Was that the hardest part over the physical side? Yeah, I mean, I think in bike racing, you're only really famous in your own world. So when you go to the TT, it's ridiculous. It's like being a superstar whilst you're on the Isle of Man. Then you come back, no one knows you. <laughs> and then like in the paddock at BSB, same, you know, you're, you're famous, people want your picture. So I'd gone from the highs of what had happened at the 2010 TT and everywhere I went, I was, you know, being recognised and stuff within the sport. And then you get smashed up and you have a frame on your leg and you're going round with, on a pair of crutches with a set of tracky pants that are cut up and because you can't wear anything else because you've got a frame on your leg and just looking ill and horrendous. You just think, you know, you just feel like you're at the lowest point in life that you could ever be and no one's interested in what you're doing, no one's interested in your results or whatever anymore. And So to get through that and, you know, I had times when I tried to take breaks and go abroad to try swim because it was good for the, the leg with the frame on. Um, yeah, people looking at you like you're weird and stuff. So you have to like stay strong and just believe in what you're doing. But um, yeah, it's definitely tough. How dark did it get for you? Like in the in the kind of worst days of that recovery and that rehab. Like how you know, were there some days where it was really really tough for you to even get up and kind of go after it? Yeah, when you when you're in hospital on all uh, all the meds and stuff, it's a bad place. And then you come back and you're on your own, try to look after yourself and still on meds. You know, I've always the f the first time I didn't really know much about all um, morphines and stuff like that. I just sort of knew that it wasn't great for you, so I tried to take less than what they were giving me all the time. But there's moments where you have no choice. You know, the pains are bad. You have to just take whatever's available. Um, but then throughout injuries after it, I've like pretty much tried to not have any of it, if possible, because um, the, it's a total another side to your injury is trying to get off morphine-based drugs and the stuff that they bring as well, other issues that they bring with you. So yeah, it's I think um, it's hard to know what's best to do when you've never had it before. Obviously, the determination that you you had to show, I suppose, to get over it and to to get back fit. How how determined were you? Did you have a real kind of strong mentality to like smash through it and and get back on the bike? And what was the, what was the end goal that you were kind of chasing to really kind of drive you on? And the biggest factor for me was that it's it took time to become a TT winner in the first place, and then to get to the point that I got. So I won in two thousand and seven. And then I had not great bikes and stuff in 2008, sort of changed teams in 2009 and got back to a couple of wins. And in 2010, got te uh, the five wins. So it was sort of like, right, this is it now, you know, I'm off. And then it got stopped. Mm. So I couldn't accept that. I think, I, I don't know if I ever would accept it, but maybe if... Well, I, no, I won't accept it because it's happened again when I've got 16 wins and I still don't accept it. <laughs> but yeah, between 2010 and 2021 now, there's like six TTs I've either missed or ridden with a broken leg or significant injuries <laughs> to not be able to go and win races. So I look at that and think like uh, even if you put four TTs down, it's 20, 20 races that I've missed out on that I think that I should have had a fair chance at. So I just keep wanting to come back and, and get those wins that I should have got, really. I mean, it's not probably the best way of looking at it because in our sport, you get injured and pretty much everyone is going to get injured at some point. But, um, yeah, that's how I look at it. <laughs> it's not a bad record in the races you have raced there, is it? So, um, did you ever think that your career was over altogether? Yeah. Um, only for the fact that I thought I'd struggle to get good bikes again, more than anything, you know. I think um, in the first place, Sean Muir stood by me with the bikes, um, but he thought I was going to be racing the year after, and I never was. And then I did the um, Macau race for him exactly a year after, and it went really well, and we got a podium. So then I thought, right, that's it now, the belief will be back. and So everything was lined up uh, for 2012, and then my leg broke again because it wasn't 
healed properly, was infected and stuff. So that was in January. So to make that phone call to Sean to tell him I was supposed to be um, in BSB in Superbike that year. So, you know, he'd taken a massive gamble on giving me that opportunity and to have to ring him to tell him that it's not going to happen again was bad. <laughs> so then I did end up riding at the TT that year with, uh, with my leg broken. And then I had two years out again, having the damage that had been done sort of put right. Um, so then I came back again in Macau and I trained so hard throughout that gap because I knew that I had to come back and be straight on it. I didn't have time to be making like two years to try and get back to where I was. Um, so the, the training that I did with my frame on was like more than I'd ever done without a frame. Um, and then we, I wanted to do my card put absolutely every single time I went training in the gym, cycling, anything that I did, I just kept thinking about Macau and that, you know, that was going to be my comeback. And then when I spoke to Sean about it, it ended up that we never <clears throat> got an entry. I don't think he thought I was going to be ready because I still had a frame on my leg and the entries closed in September and I still had a frame on my leg after 18 months. So uh, I kind of blew my lid a little bit when I found out we didn't have an entry and I wasn't happy at all. It was like the end of the world for me. Um, obviously I was going to have to wait right until the middle of the next year to do any racing so uh, luckily Sean got on to the, the organisers and got us like the first reserve and as soon as somebody withdrew we got in um, and then I went on to win it so I think it's just been sort of grateful that I've had the bikes to be able to go do that with. What did you learn from the recovery process mentally? So obviously there's a lot of people out there that might be struggling with an injury at the moment. You said that people contact you on Twitter quite a lot, or used to. Um, but what, what would you kind of pass on to them that you learned from your kind of process? Um, it, I mean, every injury is different, so it's difficult. You know, when people contact me with a frame on the leg, I'm like on a mission with a frame on my leg, <laughs> which is hard to get people to do because they're horrible. It's like the worst thing ever. But there's also different types of, they put a frame on people just for a straightforward broken tibia nowadays, um, which for me, you can walk on the minute you come out of hospital, you can pretty much crack on. It's gonna be sore, but you can crack on and you'll probably heal very quickly, like three, four months. Um, but then the other side of it, you know, if I'm trying to tell someone that you can do that, but they're in the state that I was in in 2010, you're not gonna be walking in it in three to four months, no matter how superhuman you are. So. Yeah, it's, um, I think you have to listen to your own body and sort of push to what your body can do. And sometimes I felt great going to the gym and I'd train a few days a week and then I, sometimes I'd have a week off, couldn't even go to the gym for a week because what I'd done created so much pain and made it so sore, you know, I couldn't go. So, yeah, it's, you've got to listen to your body. Uh, what things, so just moving away from kind of your injury now and into kind of um, performing under pressure, so obviously there's been quite a lot of races where people have been looking at you and, and your name and kind of looking for you to, to win the race. Um, so when you're under that amount of pressure, what do you do to kind of just relax and kind of perform under that intense scrutiny? Uh, I think, to be honest, this sort of, the in-between bit, if, you've, if you're like third or fifth fastest is harder to deal with because if you're fastest at the end of practice week say at the TT or you've quali qualified on pole in British then you sort of go into it with confidence that you are, you are the fastest so you should be able to win today and you know that's that's what you believe so that sort of brings confidence and takes pressure away if you're like 10th then you pretty much know that you can't win and you know that it's not going to be your day so that takes the pressure away as well Whereas if you're like third or fourth or whatever and you do still know there's a chance, then you sort of think, I'm going to have to push maybe harder than I have done so far this week. Or So I think, uh, yeah, the pressure builds up a bit more then. And But I always remember that I'm, I want to go there to win. It's the only reason I want to go there. So if I'm worried about the pressure, then I need to not go or stop worrying. So. Where do you get that mentality from? You know, is that something that you've kind of had through your family members or something you've taught yourself to be so objective and kind of relaxed about things? Yeah, I don't know really, because there's not really any sport in our family. I mean, my dad played rugby, but I never saw any of it. 
Um, so yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I think a, a bit of my competitiveness with riding the road bikes when I met the the lads I used to go out on, they were older than me and they were on bigger bikes. They <clears throat> they were already on seven fifties and thousands or nine hundreds back then. So when I got my two fifty, I had to ride pretty hard, and I was seventeen, they were twenty one or whatever. So yeah, I was sort of like the one. I had to come on quick, basically. So I think right from the start of riding bikes, that's that's the situation I was in. So as soon as I went club racing, I wanted to win. And then as soon as I won, I moved up to the next one and I wasn't winning, I wanted to win. So I've never really had that point where it's been easy and enjoyable, really. <laughs> Are you like that with anything else in your life, like away from, away from racing at home, like super competitive? Yeah, pretty much everything I do. <laughs> There's certain things now because of my leg I have to accept that I'm not going to be very good at it, but I try not to let the leg get in the way. <laughs> would you say you're a different person on the track versus off it, or do you think you're kind of similar in both environments? Uh, probably fairly similar, maybe a bit more aggressive on the tracks than, than in normal life. Yeah. And before a race, um, do you listen to music at any point? Do you, is there a kind of go-to playlist that you'll go to to uh, get you in the zone? No, not really. I mean, I've done sometimes in the past just to stop people talking to me, really. But um, I'm not. I'm not really somebody that needs to get psyched up or anything. I'm pretty bad at even warming up. I just like go from louching around to getting on a bike, which is not ideal. But yeah. Well, what were your favourite food to eat the night before? So like you just before the biggest race of the week. What's like your go-to like evening meal or like breakfast before the race? Again, I don't really have any set stuff like that. I mean. Uh, I eat a lot of chicken, but it's not for any like nutritional factors. It's just I'm not a big fan of red meat. Um, do like steak, but yeah, I don't really have any set routines for food. And how did, what about after the race? I talked about before that, but afterwards, obviously, it must be a huge adrenaline rush. So after that race, how do you kind of come down from that and just um, kind of get yourself to sleep? I suppose. TT's hard, especially in practice week, because yeah practices at night so we don't leave the line till half six I think the, the start of practice so a couple of hours at, at half past eight you're doing 200 mile an hour and then you laid in your bed at half nine <laughs> like heads just ringing it's like you've been in a nightclub all night and you're thinking of a million things that happened in that lap and what you could do to make the bike better how you can ride better so it's hard to sleep during practice week and then it runs into race week because you've not slept so good and then race starts at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or whatever. So it's, yeah, the TT is always a tough one, but I think because um, it's every single day, you just keep fighting through it and get to the end and then you just collapse. <laughs> <laughs> For those people that don't ride and have definitely not ridden at the TT, what, what does that feel like when you're doing that top speed and you're like, you know, th you must just, things flying past you? Like, how does that, how does that feel? How does it make you feel, but also how does it, now, what does it compare to? Does it compare to anything? Uh, top speed never really feels that fast. The, the only time I've sort of felt fast top speed wise is the Northwest. If you're, if you're in a super bike race on a bike that can do more than 200 mile an hour and you slipstream in another bike, that feels fast. But at the TT, you're normally on your own, not quite 200 mile an hour, so it's like a big difference between 195, 205, it's a big difference. Um, it's more like corners that are like the end of Cronky Vardy or something like that, that's more the like, this is fast. <laughs> so if you can go back and relive any race from your career, which one would it be and why, why would you choose that? Um, probably the, the fifth one of the five. <clears throat> it wasn't the greatest race and a few of the riders broke down and stuff, but I think it was just nice to the way it ended on the last lap with such a big lead that I could actually take it all in a bit. Um, it had been a hard week, obviously leading pretty much every night of practice, every single race, winning every race up until then, and going into Friday's race with a lot of people wanting it to happen. Um, and then the disappointment of when the race started, I had a problem with the bike and it, that was it, it was over. The sort of dream was over, but then it was red flagged and restarted. So the dream was back on and it was like crazy what happened that, that year. Um, 
so yeah, to, to get that last lap, knowing I had 50 odd seconds and, you know, everybody waving around the, the track and I could just pull a few wheels and enjoy it a bit was nice. <laughs> uh, if you could choose three bikes to be in your garage forever, what would they be? Um, my 2016 Tyco Superstock bike that got stolen from NEC. I did 133 mile an hour standing start on it. Um, loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, probably my Paget Senior and Superbike winning from 2010 and uh, Yamaha MotoGP bike. 